morning. Good morning, everybody. Bienvenue. We are very pleased to have you at this UNESCO session on such an important topic and with such a great panel, a multi-stakeholder panel. And I'm Guy Berger. I'm Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development here at UNESCO. And here's my colleague on my left, Indrajit Banerjee. He's Director of Knowledge Societies at UNESCO. And the two of us are co-chairing this. Indrajit, are you excited? Very much so, Mr. Berger. And I think it's a very timely and relevant session. And we're delighted to have all of you here with us. Hopefully, as we go along, the session will become more and more interesting and the room will get extremely packed. With that hope that we're going to start, Guy, I'll let you do the introductions. Good. So we're going to try and keep the pace moving fast because artificial intelligence is moving fast and we have very interesting people here. So the speakers, I'll just tell you briefly who they are. We have, first of all, His Excellency, Mr. Federico Salas Lofte, Lofte, the ambassador and plenipotentiary permanent delegate of Mexico to UNESCO. So we have a member state involved. Then we have Ms. Nena Nwakanma on my left over there. And people may know her well from the IGF and she's with the uh, World Wide Web Foundation. She's interim policy director there. Then we have Marco Grobelnik, who's right on the, on the far side over there. And he is uh, in head of AI at the Josef Stefan Institute in um, Slovenia. And he's Slovenia's digital champion and also on the OECD's AI, uh, AI Go uh, committee. And then we have Sylvia Grundman, who's head of the Media and Internet Division at the Council of Europe, a great friend of UNESCO. Thank you again for coming on a panel, a UNESCO panel. And then we have Thomas Hughes, who's executive director at Article 19, uh, which people will know Article 19 is the, probably the leading uh, uh, NGO research group technical advice advocacy worldwide on freedom of expression issues online and offline. And then we will also have uh, an input, uh, a video input from Mila Romanoff, who is from Global Pulse, which people may know is the big data section of the UN Secretary General's office. So let me, having introduced people, just give you an introjet and he can tell you something about what we're hoping to focus on. But before I do that, who here has heard of the UNESCO concept, Internet Universality? Could you raise your hands? Anybody heard the UNESCO concept, Internet Universality? Okay, well, a few. So for those who don't know, I'm quickly going to tell you. UNESCO member states agreed this concept, Internet Universality, that they want one Internet to serve everybody and be available for everybody. That's as simple as it is. Internet for everybody, everywhere. But what kind of internet and why? It's an internet that could help achieve the sustainable development goals. And to have that, you need these four principles. And this is what the UNESCO member states agreed. The four principles it is very easy to remember. Uh, R, O, A, M, R, O, A, M, Rome, which stands for rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder participation that the internet, if we want the internet to be as we want and to contribute maximally to sustainable development, we want it to be aligned to human rights, to openness, to accessibility, and to multi-stakeholder participation. That's the way UNESCO approaches all internet questions, whether it's a question of radicalization of youth online, whether it's a question of so-called fake news, or whether it's a question of artificial intelligence. Now, we know in the same way that fake news can mean many things to many people, artificial intelligence can mean many things to many people. So I don't think we are aiming to define definitively what is artificial intelligence in this session, but we're speaking about the broad range of advanced technologies and the issues around them. These technologies, which are dealing with big data, dealing with algorithms, dealing with network technologies, these are the things that we're trying to address now. And UNESCO is particularly concerned with human rights, with openness, accessibility questions about AI, and also very concerned that these debates should be multi-stakeholder. Hence, this panel is multi-stakeholder in its nature. 
into regional organizations, civil society, member states. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a freedom of expression organizations. So we're ready to go, I think, and we'd like this discussion to pay particular attention to these questions of rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder participation. Now, there's one person I realize I didn't introduce you because I didn't look further along. One more panelist. Uh, her name is Elodie Vial. She is the head of journalism and technology at Reporters Sans Frontier. Uh, I'm sure you all know Reporters Sans Frontier. With that said, Indridit, let's go. Thank you, uh, Guy, and let me join you in uh, welcoming all the panel members and the participants for being here with us. I would like to also acknowledge the presence here amongst us of our Assistant Director General, Mr. Moise Chakchuk, who is sitting here with us. He is uh, spearheading our work in the area of artificial intelligence, so his presence here is uh, extremely crucial too. Now, uh, as my colleague uh, Guy Berger just said, uh, we want this to be an interactive session, no long speeches. Uh, we are the CI sector. We believe in action, not too much words. I think it was very well framed uh, by my colleague, Mr. Berger. Uh, the Rome principles, the internet universality as a concept, uh, should be underpinning all our work uh, in this area, not only when it comes to artificial intelligence, but everything else we do uh, in the field of uh, new technologies and uh, knowledge societies. As all of us know, and we have seen over the last uh, few days, and weeks and months, artificial intelligence has great potential to foster open and inclusive knowledge societies and promote openness in education and scientific processes, digital inclusion, and cultural diversity. Indeed, these can contribute to strengthen democracy, peace, and help achieve sustainable development goals. And let me reiterate the fact that as the title rightfully suggests, this session is going to be focusing on not artificial intelligence per se, but uh, how artificial intelligence can be leveraged, harnessed for promoting human rights and sustainable development goals with a multi-stakeholder inclusive and open approach. So having said this, uh, artificial intelligence could also exacerbate inequalities and increase existing digital divides. We are already seeing a clear polarization in the world in terms of countries which are very advanced, which have not only the know-how, but the resources and funding uh, to invest very heavily in artificial intelligence. And I guess the race is on. And that is why I think this session is extremely timely. It is now, unlike in the past with other technologies, it is now that we can put things uh, right uh, set things in the right context, uh, keeping in mind human rights, uh, sustainable development goals, before we get this one wrong too. We have missed many of these technological advances, and I think our discussions on ethics and other important dimensions have come far too late often in the day or in the game. And this is an opportunity for us, and this is where UNESCO comes into the picture, and the communication information sector in particular, dealing with new communication, information communication technologies, to bring to the fore in this debate on artificial intelligence a whole range of new technologies which are emerging and will continue to emerge of how do we put them in the right framework so that these debates, these crucial debates can take place at the outset and not by the time it gets too late because by then and the race would have long started, uh, directions would have been set, and it would be very difficult to turn the clock around and go back and set things right. So I think, as uh, my colleague Guy Berger rightfully pointed out, this is a great opportunity for us uh, at UNESCO in the war and the world in general, and uh, uh, how big data is influencing development processes for different countries, increasing access to new technologies, and resulting in knowledge and information, which has a power to transform national economies and positively influence innovations, 
social progress on the building of more inclusive knowledge societies. Then it will, of course, beg the question how are national governments responding to the changes being brought about by advanced ICTs, uh, like artificial intelligence? What is the current understanding on the ensemble of these technologies? So without much further ado, I would like to invite the distinguished ambassador and permanent delegate of Mexico to UNESCO to give us some of his opening thoughts. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank our two uh, moderators, uh, first of all, uh, and I want to uh, thank UNESCO for inviting, inviting me, and more than inviting me, inviting Mexico to be present at this, uh, at this panel. We, uh, in my country, we think it's particularly important that uh, a, a forum like this, which uh, we understand is probably the first time that there's this link between artificial intelligence and the questions of human rights and sustainable development. And that is a crucial issue that we really need to address and focus on, uh, as you correctly said before, it's too late. Uh, I, I would also like to point out that Mexico has been very active in promoting the discussion of these issues in, uh, in UN New York. Uh, we are presently chairing the Science and Technology and Innovation Forum for the Sustainable Development Goals for 2018-2019 uh, at UN headquarters in, uh, in New York. Let me start by saying that I, we think it's very necessary to recognize that the development of emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence have accelerated exponentially in the last few years due to current technological and financial trends. These emerging technologies will necessarily impact areas of our common life, such as agriculture, manufacturing, medicine, education, entertainment. But they also have implications on a social, economical, ethical, and legal nature, which must be discussed now in order to maximize the benefits and mitigate the risks. Indeed, new technologies can be used positively to accelerate solutions to accomplish the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda and their 169 targets, but they can also increase inequality among and within countries, replace labor forces, affect vulnerable groups, foster a concentration of critical knowledge and wealth, and even pose significant challenges to human rights. The demand for specialized human resources with greater technical and STEAM training is increasing. This includes both technical jobs as well as other professionals who are capable of implementing the new technologies in their own expertise. This impacts the universal right for higher and specialized education. Likewise, the use of intelligence systems will have a profound effect on the labor market, eliminating jobs, especially those with a greater component of mechanical skills. And these jobs, as you are quite aware, are mainly concentrated in developing countries. On the other hand, new, better paying jobs will be created. The question is whether the population in general will have the skills to obtain those jobs or whether it will increase the inequality gap affecting disproportionately marginalized and vulnerable sectors of society and their right to a decent job. That is why we think education at all levels is key both to increase the artificial intelligence expertise and to ensure that the benefits of AI development are shared. It is also necessary to develop and support systems that allow an easier access to lifelong learning, including retraining. Regarding the ethical aspect, it is urgent that we begin analyzing the requirements that intelligent systems must have in order to prevent prejudices and negative social, cultural, and political reactions, such as hate speech through the social media. In particular, there is a growing need to increase transparency and reliability. The design of an ethical framework to help guide good decision making by, th by those who are finding new uses for artificial, inten artificial inten intelligence technologies will guide it to be used thoughtfully, inclusively, and ethically in all countries to achieve the greater benefits for society. Technology is neutral and AI might not be capable of having prejudices, but the people programming it can. In this sense, it will be necessary to promote more representative systems that take into consideration diverse and open views of the population, and this can be achieved by strengthening and promoting alliances between all relevant stakeholders. 
Some of artificial intelligence's applications are already questionable. Bioethics and science development, data collection that intrudes on privacy, facial recognition, algorithms that are supposed to identify hostile behavior or are imbued with racial prejudice, <coughs> excuse me, military drones and autonomous lethal weapons. However, these technologies could be harnessed to help solve important challenges for humanity, such as aging societies, environmental threats and global conflicts, refugee support, as well as to achieve the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. While research is moving full speed ahead on the technical side of artificial intelligence, not much headway has been made on the ethical front. The World Economic Forum and Harvard University have started this discussion regarding the use of AI for inclusion, as well as the International Telecommunications Union through its uh, AI Summit for Good, which is why it is imperative to, to start an ethical dialogue and address the unprecedented human rights and social challenges that arise. UNESCO is the perfect institution for pursuing this objective fully in accordance with its mandate. To begin addressing these issues and the adoption of information and communication technologies, the government of Mexico has created an Office of National Digital Strategy, which is attached to the Office of the President, and it has established the foundations for the development of a national digital policy that will allow us to use technology to transform our government into an open, modern, innovative one, and to turn it into a platform that detonates innovation, development, and inclusion. Within the basis of the national digital strategy, we establish a process that provides a framework for reference to how technologies work and how they interact in a broad context that includes the technological ecosystems, including their positive and negative impacts and implications. As a result and taking into account the capabilities of computational thinking, disruptive technologies, data mining, entrepreneurship, and customized services according to the needs of the users, the government of Mexico is promoting many initiatives regarding the internalization of emerging technologies. One of them is a national strategy for AI, another for blockchain. The main pillar of this study is the strengthening and the promotion of a multi-stakeholders dialogue to help create better practices as well as public policies in order to achieve the SDGs targets and avoid stiffening innovation and entrepreneurship. This is why Mexico considers it vitally important to establish alliances and create synergies between the private sector and governments, as well as academia and civil society, in order to take advantage of the technological developments and innovations of companies and industries, facilitate its distribution, and allow access and training to the population for its most optimal application. Uh, furthermore, in supporting AI development, we need to foster investment in the infrastructure that supports it, especially good quality data, internet connectivity, and legal frameworks such as modern intellectual property law and privacy protection. Uh, this is why, and this is to conclude, it is paramount to analyze the impact of the rapid technological change within regional and international organizations and forums, including UNESCO, in order to address its challenges and opportunities in the effective implementation of the 2030 Agenda, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and it is wonderful to see a member state engaging with these issues like that. Now, uh, you highlighted a lot of the global issues, and I was pleased you also uh, described the national level uh, with Mexico itself, and you described the regional level and UNESCO as well. This is super. Now, we come to our next speaker, uh, who will also make the introductory remarks, uh, Nena Yuakanma from the World Wide Web Foundation. Now, if you want to see artificial intelligence personified in a self-learning person, <laughs> self-learning organism, I present you, Nena. Oh my goodness. Okay, the only thing I can accept is that I'm tweeting while I'm here, including video tweets. Huh? Uh, let me not accept everything V says. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming here. So the, vi the last video tweet I did was like, people are still flocking in for artificial intelligence. I was in the last session in this room, it was full, and this session was full again. What is it with artificial intelligence that is making everyone excited? I don't know. <clears throat> I was asked to, to speak on something 
less glamorous, which is uh, policy implications at the global level at this time. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. I work with the World Wide Web Foundation as AIDS Policy Director. Um, I've had a good advice. I'm going to say don't go beyond three points because people won't remember the fourth one. So I will keep to three points, and under each three points, three points. So it's going to be three times three. Um, the first implication I, I would like to put on the table is that of access, right? Um, so we've, we're re gently reaching the 50-50 tipping point in which we have 50% of the global population access with access uh, online access and the other 50% offline. Uh, so the, the question around access is uh, how can we be developing technologies uh, when we have half of the population online? Um, can we move ahead when we are leaving 50% behind your excellency? I don't know. On the access, I've noted the, one of the, uh, the things that are challenging to access. Of course, the first is affordability. Um, we at the Web Foundation host the Alliance for Affordable Internet because across the world, um, those who are offline, uh, the first barrier to access is the, the price, the cost of accessing the internet itself before you even get to any other thing. So affordable internet is something that we need to be very worried about when we are dealing in policy. The other one is meaningful access. When, when I finally put my $10 to get connected, what exactly am I being connected to? What content am I getting? What's the feedback? What's the return on investment for someone in Burkina Faso, in Niger, in Sudan, who will put $10, which basically is maybe 15 to 20% of that person's uh, uh, monthly income to, to get one gigabyte of data what is he or she getting in return. So <laughs> the meaningfulness of, of, the, of the access is very important. Um, I cannot talk, not talk about humane, the humanity part of it. Um, I'm sure you must have heard about the, the principles for the contract for the web uh, that Sir Tim Berners-Lee launched Monday last week during the web summit. And one of the principles is that we should be developing technologies that support the best in humanity and challenge the worst in humanity. Uh, and as he said, uh, for those who created the internet, created the World Wide Web, the initial, uh, the initial motivation was that when we bring technology to human beings, human beings will use technology for good. But that is not what we are looking at the moment. So the first thing, policy consideration I would like to put on the table as we go ahead with our artificial intelligence considerations is that we should use artificial intelligence for the best for humanity and also use it to challenge the worst in humanity. So that was access. The second thing I want to talk about is trust. Uh, trust trust in, in technology, trust on, on, on the internet. Uh, and I think this UNESCO, you are hosting us. We trust you. That's why we came here. <coughs> You're hosting the Internet of Trust. I think over the years it's come to be bigger than we imagined it to be, especially in the last few months when things have come up. So tr trust is very important. And on the trust, I've noted data governance uh, because um, everywhere you go, they want you to put down your data. They want you to put down your, your biometric data. Uh, I think we should be able as users to ask the question, where is it going to? Who is handling it? How far, who else are you going to share my data with? And transparency in governance is, is really very important to us as the Web Foundation. And I think that while we, we as state or stakeholders, we need to take this um, responsibility very important. Of course, rights, uh, um, technology for, for, <laughs> for, for education, for health, for agriculture, for sustainable development, it's our right. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, this time around, the UN is not looking at SDGs as something the North will give to the South, but as something we are in it together. Hashtag for everyone. Hashtag leave no one behind. I'm certainly not going to be left behind. The, the other thing is online safety. Uh, online safety. For, for those who are working, and big shout out to everyone who is working on Me Too, on, on gender-based violence, whether it's offline or online. What happens is that um, the, the same 
um, violence, the same gender-based discrimination, the same inequalities that we have offline have come online. And when women come online, they, they are threatened, they are, they are, they are abused, uh, they, they are shut down, I mean, physically shut down, verbally shut down, and they withdraw. And, and I, I'm, I'm just saying, these middle-aged white male who are developing AI technologies, are they aware of the black older women or younger women who are coming online? And, and how, do we, um, in, how do we engage on maintaining safety uh, and the trust around the whole of the technology? Because if you try it once and it doesn't work, then you're afraid. You lose trust and, and you go back. So trust is one of those things we, we want to talk about, we want to take into consideration, and it should be part, uh, online safety should be part of it. Finally, data. Data is my third point. My first was access, my second was trust. My last one is data. For those who know me, I've been working in opening up data. But on one hand, we have open data. Uh, we are saying make it open by default. Public data should be publicly available so we can use it in transport, in agriculture, in schools, in everything. And we cannot have effective artificial intelligence without data. Data is the lifeblood of any artificial technology. So the availability of data is very important. And what I would like to challenge everyone here is to do their part in making sure that open day, day, public data is uh, indeed open, available, in the format that artificial intelligence can use. The other thing is data integrity, um, information integrity, or otherwise the, the flip side will be fake news. And, and it is very important that if we are building artificial intelligence systems, we, we build it on data that is of quality, data that is true, because what, whatever you feed into the system will, will ultimately affect what, what the machine or whatever does. So if we are not feeding it with data that has integrity, then we are all um, the big F word. That's where we are. If we don't have, <laughs> I know I'm, I shouldn't be, I cussed in the last session, so I'm watching myself in this <laughs> one. <laughs> right. The, the other thing about after data availability integrity is of course privacy, privacy of my personal data. Um, uh, I think the, the debate is, is now here. Um, we want to be sure that um, our data belongs to us and we know where it is going. We, we are sure that it is in safe hands. And I think that we cannot um, be developing any AI policy at this time without taking into consideration um, the respect of pri uh, personal data privacy. And it is good that we have GDPR, which is beginning. African countries are also beginning. And quite a number of other countries across the world are uh, beginning to think, beginning to understand that our data is an extension of our own selves. And I would like to leave you with this thought. Uh, would you rather be naked for two minutes or would you rather that your Google search history be exposed? I think I'd like to go naked for a minute and cover up <laughs> because very soon you'll be seeing other pretty women and you forget what you've seen. But if you have my, my Google, come on guys, if you have my Google data uh, history, search history, actually you just know, you will know what is outside, you will know what is inside, and you even know what's my future, and that I don't want you to have. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, and then I think uh, uh, you uh, presented some extremely interesting uh, and very useful insights into uh, artificial intelligence, uh, not only so much for itself and its own sake, but you highlighted a few points which I will briefly summarize. First is the whole notion of access. As you may know, at UNESCO, we are very concerned with the uh, term that you used, the meaningfulness of the access, because uh, there is far too much of uh, uh, new technologies, etc. Uh, connectivity has been a buzzword for a long time. At the end of the day, uh, how does it uh, have an effect on people's livelihoods? And here I will introduce another element in terms of access. It's not only the meaningfulness in terms of actually changing people's livelihoods, otherwise why should I pay $10 a month or whatever it is to access the internet? 
uh, when, uh, when I don't have that kind of resources. Um, the second aspect of it is also access in terms of uh, multilingualism. As you may know, at UNESCO, we are doing a lot of work on multilingualism in cyberspace, and uh, uh, the statistics are quite pathetic, I would even say drastic, um, in terms of number of languages which are available online. Some 400 odd languages are available online out of the 7,000 official languages. Uh, about 60 to 65 percent of languages are going to disappear by the end of the century. So this becomes really wor worrisome, and it is very closely linked to the whole notion that you mentioned about meaningfulness. If the access provided is not to content which is meaningful for me, my livelihood, but also in a language which I can understand, uh, I don't see what the point of, of uh, access is. The second point you mentioned, which is again very, very significant. Before you say that, yes, I have to say something. I mentioned the R O A M, Rome. <laughs> And the A is accessibility. And as Indrid had pointed out, it covers these issues, cost, it covers the issue of language, relevance. It also covers media and information literacy. So if you want to find out more about how UNESCO sees access and what is media and information literacy, which we see as crucial for access, check it out. R-O-A-M. <laughs> Thank you. That looks like the mantra for today. Uh, in any case, I think the second point you raised, trust. Uh, highlighting special data governance and online safety. Again, very crucial issues which UNESCO is keeping a very close eye on. Uh, over the last few days also, we heard a lot of concerns expressed in terms of data governance, in terms of online safety, especially towards vulnerable of the vulnerable groups, women, children, and the statistics that we receive uh, on the situation, the state of children and women uh, in terms of what's happening online is quite, uh, uh, quite dismal. And last but not least, you talk about data, open data again, uh, the lifeblood of artificial intelligence of all uh, intelligent systems, uh, which also highlights the importance of data integrity, privacy of data, the GDPR coming into effect is a positive uh, step in this direction. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Nina, for those uh, uh, and, opening and comments. And the open data is part of UNESCO's O in the ROAM. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Marco Grobelnik to make his initial statement. Uh, please keep it compact because we'll come back to many of the questions that you, uh, you raise or you mention uh, in your statements. Thank you. Well, it's hard to keep these things compact, but I will uh, do it, right? Uh, so AI, right? So I'm researcher in AI. I have many hats. Uh, most of my time I tried to create AI, right, for last 20, 30 years almost from my high school on. So these things go up and down, right, in the last few years. Uh, this means like after 2010, somehow is this explosion of AI, uh, which was mostly due to uh, basically one, one single invention, which is uh, like 60 years old. Yeah? So this is what, what's called nowadays deep learning, right? So this is this magic tool which, uh, which is open source. Everybody can use it. You have free tutorials. In principle, uh, uh, I try to explain it to uh, my son and kids, high school kids, and they understand it because it's that easy. It's not hard, right? I don't know how many of you are engineers and uh, definitely you have interest in AI sitting here, right? But uh, 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 if you think AI is hard, it is not, right? So this is like doing Lego, pretty much. Uh, so uh, try to sneak in into at least maybe a couple of short tutorials, uh, so and your level of competence uh, of AI will uh, certainly go up. Now, the question is, is AI, uh, is this the final stage of AI? Of course not. Uh, you can expect in the le next, like, maybe five, ten years, right, uh, way, way more. Everything what we have now will be just one Lego brick for the AI which is coming now in the next maybe five to ten years. So you can expect lots of innovations, right? Still, I mean, it seems like AI is very powerful, but it, at the end it's not really, you know. You can have a fairy tale like Snow White, right? AI c cannot come even close to understand Snow White as a kid understands AI. So this is reality of AI as well, right? But still, there was this invention, right, um, uh, which uh, 
which is a very simple uh, algorithm actually, which enabled what? Uh, suddenly computers started seeing objects, hearing, understanding, translating, not really understanding, translating, yes, uh, but machine still doesn't understand how uh, the world is causally connected. It doesn't understand very simple text like this, right? And so on. So, but um, uh, there's a, there are huge investments uh, going on these days, uh, which would um, um, even overcome these things. Uh, maybe just a couple of more uh, thoughts. Uh, uh, so pretty much everything is free, right? So if it looks like that AI is just <coughs> for uh, rich, big companies. It's not true. Everything is free. Everything what's relevant is free. Today, even the big companies like Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon, and so on, Microsoft, they, they cannot afford closing down this technology. So that's why you can get all these uh, things available and you can use it, actually. Now, another question is question of data, right? Is data, so data makes a big difference, right? If you have data, then you can do things. Data is pretty much also available. Maybe not the most valuable ones, but uh, uh, if you make some effort. So in principle, um, AI is really good uh, uh, topic really for underfunded, uh, non-rich countries, institutions, or even individuals really to make a big difference. Uh, the, only, the only thing is fear of technology. Well, without fear you can do this. With fear probably you cannot. Uh, and competence, knowledge, right? So and this knowledge is also more or less available. So this is my, my maybe uh, main message to, um, to you, right? So since you have interest in AI, you can participate in AI as well. It's not something which is uh, closed down, right? Uh, what's also interesting, right, since we are on the panel of uh, human rights and SDGs, right, so uh, how AI can help to all these things. So, uh, well, since I said things are available and uh, problems with, well, human rights violations, SDG, all these SDG points uh, which we know. So this was a problem always, right? So what we can, what's the difference today? We can uncover this. We can uncover this and we can see it and we can even influence with this technology. AI is not only a threat, which is said many, many times, right? Uh, very popular topic by kind of important speakers, right? Uh, how this singularity will come, nothing will come. Uh, this is uh, uh, mostly, I would say, nonsense. Uh, AI is really a tool which can help as well. It can be a danger, I agree. Autonomous weapons, many things are problematic, but uh, in the same way as AI can be a threat, can also be a help, right? Uh, we just, we need to see it from the other side. Uh, uh, well, uh, maybe so much for now, and I'll continue later. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Marco. And uh, just to sum up what you said, that this is a, a fast-moving game. Yeah, let's give him a call. It's very fast moving, there's huge investments, but what was really very interesting that he said was it links up to Rome because O is about open markets and open opportunities and he seems to think that actually this is not the preserve of huge actors, that he thinks there's enough free software and open data for everybody to get in on this. That's about openness, that's very interesting. Okay, I have the, the, the pleasure now with my co-moderator. I get to invite two inputs. He only is doing one at a time, but I have two because we, we move now to a video. And this is from Mila Romanoff from what I said was Global Pulse, which is the UN Secretary General's uh, uh, initiative on big data. And this is about the UN trying to get smart about big data in relation to sustainable development. So if we could switch to the video. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this opportunity um, to present to you today. Apologies that I'm not able to be there in person. And thank you to UNESCO for um, inviting me. Um, I am a privacy and legal specialist at the Special Initiative of the UN Secretary General, uh, where I lead a privacy and ethical program. Um, we look into how big data and artificial intelligence could be used uh, in a responsible way to assist the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
Global Pulse works with various agencies across the system and private sector um, to uh, mine, to, uh, to get access and analyze uh, data coming from various um, sources such as postal transactions data, financial institutions, mobile sector data, um, radio, and uh, many others. And how such data could be analyzed in a responsible way um, to, for example, understand um, mobility patterns so that humanitarian, key humanitarian aid could be delivered. Or how could we uh, anonymize data coming from public social media uh, to understand uh, perceptions on immunizations or specific health-related or education-related policy. As part of these uh, missions and as part of these projects, we also worked on we also work on tools and guidances on how we do this and how we can do it in a responsible way, um, incorporating privacy techniques, uh, privacy protective techniques, as well as ethical um, codes of conduct. Um, so within the four minute time frame, I was asked today to give a short presentation on um, some of the key initiatives within the UN Global Pulse and UN in general. Uh, in 2016, UN Global Pulse established and currently co-chairs a UN Privacy Policy Group, which includes all of the agencies, representative of all of the agencies and in UN organizations across the system. I'm proud to, uh, to suggest that just a month ago, the UN Privacy Policy Group has adopted and developed and adopted a set of the principles on uh, the protection of personal data and privacy for the United Nations. The principles aim to harmonize the approach on data protection across the system, as well as to recommend ways forward, such as the development of more detailed and comprehensive guidelines um, for each agency in accordance with their mandates, as well as the implementation and use of the risks, harms, and benefits assessments for the data processing prior to any project, or the uh, considerations of um, harms and specifics of group harms when it comes to vulnerable communities and groups of individuals, including women, children, uh, refugees, and many others. Um, there are 10 principles um, that are provided in the, in the, in the, in the set and uh, they will soon be published. I'm also happy to say that specifically on big data and um, artificial intelligence, um, the United Nations Development Group um, has issued a guidance note, which is a more detailed um, document, um, providing a set of recommendations on how the United Nations organizations should be dealing or could be dealing with um, non-UN um, organizations, particularly private sector, when it comes to accessing data coming from private sector. It recommends to perform due diligence and ensuring that uh, partners we are working with also um, have proper standards on data protection and the data there um, they provide us with or would be providing us with is coming from uh, proper sources and channels. Um, the due diligence also recommend the employment of the risks assessment um, man and management uh, frameworks to mitigate the risks that are coming with data use as well as those coming with uh, data non-use. Um, so the guidance note is, looks into um, also those missed opportunities of when the data is not used and how harmful it could be uh, to our, um, to our uh, society. Um, lastly, I want to mention um, the development of the risk assessment tool by the United Nations Global Pulse, which actually is the tool that is recommended by the UN um, principles on personal data protection and privacy, it could be one of those tools, um, or the United Nations Development Group Note, set of quick key questions that everyone who is dealing with the data or who is starting a project need to ask himself or herself in order to identify the key risks coming that uh, are coming with the data use, as well as those risks that are coming uh, with uh, if the data will not be used or if this project will not proceed. Um, it, um, it allows you to balance it uh, or under and understand the assessment of uh, the pros and cons of uh, data use and non-use from a more um, human rights-based perspective. And my last point is on the uh, recent report that is very relevant to this discussion. It was issued by the United Nations Global Pulse and um, IEPP, International Association of Privacy Professionals, which actually recommends looking beyond and above privacy, that privacy is one of the tools when we talk about data, but ethics is something that will help us uh, go beyond black letter law and standards already um, provided by privacy protection. Um, it's something that will help us understand those issues that are coming with questions posed by artificial intelligence, those gray areas, like life and death decisions, right? 
um, who can answer those? So the report actually recommends a few tools that could help with making um, some of the uh, design-related questions, such as the ethical review boards or engagement um, of uh, professionals with different skills and stakeholders. Um, the tool of the recommendations also go to uh, suggest um, in the implementation of the risk assessment uh, frameworks, such as privacy impact assessment or actually ethical impact assessment. Um, and of course, the, uh, the finally, it recommends the implementation of such consideration as group harms, um, given that we are now looking at the community level data more than actually only individual level data. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions uh, following this presentation through the organizers of the uh, panel. Um, thank you again. Well, I, I'm pretty sure Mila probably woke up early in New York to watch this, this part of the presentation being live streamed. So thank you, Mila. Uh, you will remember, I hope you do, that I started off saying UNESCO has the Rome model, R-O-A-M. And amongst the R is... I, I've tweeted it. You don't need to do the campaign anymore. Amongst the R <laughs> is the right to privacy, which was very graphically uh, mentioned uh, by Nena and now was mentioned very much here, and I think that's uh, extremely interesting to highlight that uh, right. Of course, for UNESCO, the rights are key, and so too is openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder participation. Now, in terms of going further on this rights question, particularly, we, we have Thomas Hughes here, as I mentioned, Executive Director of Article 19, and uh, Thomas, uh, I hope in, you, in your remarks, uh, your initial remarks, you're also going to touch on what is the relationship between ethics and rights vis-a-vis -vis artificial intelligence. So help us, uh, how does Article 19 see that? Well, Guy, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I will touch on that briefly, but uh, with your indulgence, I'll stick to the question I was asked to prepare for, if that's also okay. Um, I'd like to start by um, reinforcing uh, Nina's comments. Uh, I must admit the, my personal jewelry is uh, still out on the nakedness versus search results question. I, I think I need to go and look at my recent search history just before I make my mind up on that. But, but in, in, you know, broadly speaking, I think I'm in favor. Um, but the, uh, the issues that you outlined, I think, are, are the core threats. And for Article 19, uh, really the three are AI-powered surveillance, data generated and used online uh, by online intermediaries and AI systems, uh, and content display and personalization, as well as content moderation and removal. So those are the kind of the three core clusters where we see threats. Now, um, we were asked to focus on what disciplines uh, are the crucial ones uh, uh, and what research needs to be undertaken looking forward to the creation of ethics standards and guidelines. Uh, and I'm going to uh, stretch your attention span, if I may. I'm going to go from Nina's three points to five. In fact, I've got two quick fire clusters of five points that I want to highlight. Uh, and I will do so within the, f within the four minutes. Um, first of all, in order to understand uh, what uh, guidelines, standards, and recommendations are actually required, it's important to understand what the challenges are uh, because they will inform where we look. So first of all, I want to highlight uh, a lack of respect for the rule of law. So current industry initiatives around AI are narrowly focused uh, on the development of technical standards, ethical frameworks and concepts such as fairness, transparency, and accountability. However, uh, these frameworks obviously have to be enforceable and they must comply uh, with the rule of law, and I'll come back to that in a second. Secondly, lack of transparency. So obviously, uh, many companies developing critical AI systems do so in ways that are non-transparent uh, and are not, uh, cannot be uh, scrutinized externally. There's a lack of accountability, so the hidden nature of AI systems makes it difficult to study or analyze the impact of AI on the right to freedom of expression, uh, unless, as in obvious cases, a tangible harm occurs. Uh, public perceptions and the role of the media, so a lot of the media discourse around AI focuses on artificial general intelligence rather than artificial narrow intelligence, and you did say, Guy, at the beginning, and I agree with you, we don't have the scope to go into large-scale definitions at this point, but I think there it's important to note the difference and also the importance of discourse to focus on narrow intelligence at this stage. Uh, and thirdly, data collection use, as has been mentioned a few times already, 
so the various uh, freedom of expression and privacy concerns that stem from the way data is being collected and used in AI systems, but, but that's been commented on by all of the panelists so far. So what does this mean in terms of which disciplines we should focus on uh, and what we should be looking uh, to research? Um, so again, five points, quick fire. So first of all, I think we have to think about the legitimate purpose. So uh, there's a lot of focus and discussion on how AI can be used to solve different problems and also earlier comments around the simplicity or complexity of AI. But I think the question that we nearly need to be asking ourselves is why? Why are we using AI in the first place? And should we promote a more deliberate understanding and even in cases delayed deployment to ensure it works better and it's more inclusive? Um, secondly, national regulation. So uh, at the national level, existing AI uh, applications are regulated broadly by traditional frameworks of legislation, including freedom of expression, data protection, consumer protection, very importantly, media and competition law, as well as different sectoral regulations and standards. Uh, but we need to look at these and to understand whether they are actually adequate for addressing the myriad of ways in which AI does impact on freedom of expression and more broadly on human rights. Also extremely importantly, and as has been mentioned, AI at the margins. So we need to research and look into the effects of AI uh, on the margins, so on the margins in terms of data collection, on the margins in terms of digital inclusion, and again, that has been mentioned. Um, because if we don't, as we all are aware, AI will simply reinforce historical biases. Uh, they will not resolve them. And then there's a the very important question of AI and content regulation. Uh, so obviously, uh, AI is a huge power, as has been outlined, and I think it will be outlined later on in terms of journalism and media. Um, but it is very poor at understanding cultural context and nuance, as has also been mentioned. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves the question and look into the question, is there a need to apply AI to foster free, pluralistic and independent media, or is there not? So again, we need to go into an open mind. Uh, and last and not least, and this one's for you, Guy, although I have to ask you not to promise to say Rome afterwards, but the Rome principles. So the Rome principles in AI. So specifically for UNESCO, uh, we need to test the Rome principles to see whether they encompass and can incorporate AI. Uh, and I think there are many very good multi-stakeholder bodies at IEEE and the Partnership on AI uh, looking into these issues. Um, but at the moment, it lacks state actors and a lot of multilateral actors. So I would strongly encourage UNESCO to get involved in those four and to add those perspectives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for your insights. Uh, I think you introduced a few new elements uh, with specific focus on uh, uh, the question of the rule of law. I think that again is uh, much more on hindsight that we are trying to fit things into uh, uh, existing or new uh, regulatory frameworks. And uh, uh, you also mentioned uh, the media discourses uh, on AI. I would like to know some more about that. What's your take on, on this? I'm sure Guy uh, would have something to say on the same, same topic because uh, I think to a great extent we're being conditioned uh, from all the positive hype and the news that we get about AI. Again, completely keeping out of sight uh, the more difficult and complex questions such as human rights, freedom of expression, content regulation in the media, uh, issues of data collection, transparency, accountability, and so on. So I think it will be very interesting to see how uh, this pans out because I think we uh, tend to neglect or ignore to a great extent the role that the media are playing in this whole AI game. Uh, I think that's, that's a very interesting new element which you brought into this discussion. And uh, uh, I'm, I hope we can come back to some of these uh, in, in our discussion. And I would like, of course, Guy's uh, point of view on some of this because he, uh, he works uh, uh, in a very concentrated manner on some of these issues relating to the media. Let me now invite uh, Ms. Sylvia Grunman uh, to make her opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank UNESCO for having put the human rights and the sustainable development goals into the focus of this discussion. This is of utmost importance um, because what we want at the Council of Europe, 
we want a human rights centered artificial intelligence and in fact a compliance with human rights, democratic principles and the rule of law. So how are we doing it concretely? You know, we are pan-European, we have 47 member states and we cater for, 80, 50, for 850 million people. So in order to assume this responsibility, we've started already two years ago and at the beginning of this year, we came out with a study and that's algorithms and human rights. Indeed, we have to debunk the fear. The fear factor is not conducive to our debate. So here is a first study to better understand the human rights implications. Everything is available on our website. If you need hard copies, contact me. So concretely, after that study, we drilled deeper and currently we are working on policy recommendations um, to come out with very concrete guidelines, not only for our member states, but also for business. So we want to give a first, some first indications with a focus on responsibility, on transparency, on accountability. By the end of this year, you will be able to see a very first, not a very first, but a very ripe draft, I hope, and that then will have to be adopted by our highest body, the Committee of Ministers. These policy guidelines that we are developing are not exclusive to Europe. On the contrary, they are blueprints. They can be used globally. You can pick and choose. So whatever fits for your respective systems, please use it, and it's free of charge. Now, we are of course aware of the manipulative powers of algorithms due to the developments, the technological developments, due to this huge speed that artificial intelligence systems have demonstrated and will further demonstrate. These manipulative powers are extremely dangerous to elections. We've seen already first examples they will become more dangerous to elections and I'm not sure that our politicians are sufficiently aware. Therefore, at the Council of Europe, we have decided to come up by the end of this year with a declaration to address these manipulative powers and to better protect our democratic principles. That will be a cumbersome policy process, but we are ready to pick up the fight. Now, we need to drill deeper, I said it. Artificial intelligence is simple, we have heard. To others, it might be complex. And I've said it already, we must debunk the fear factor. Therefore, we are currently working on a very extensive study in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, there, again, a first draft will be available in the course of the next two months. It needs to be shaped further. We are in dialogue with all stakeholders, especially with civil society. We have excellent academia on board, and it's quite an endeavor. So from that study, we will then see what concretely we can do to go more into a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence because I think it is necessary and we have heard from the late Stephen Hawking a fear expressed by a man who was very brave throughout his life and this man has said if we don't regulate artificial intelligence it will regulate us. Now if a man like him was afraid I think we need to really thoroughly reflect on what's going on here, and we cannot leave it all to the businesses, even they have deep pockets, and states always pretend to be poor and therefore need the support of the money side. Uh, this is too simple. States must also assume their responsibilities, and civil society, I call upon all of you here, they must hold states to account. We need you here, especially at the international level, and I'm very happy that UNESCO is always reaching out on all levels to civil society, bringing them all on board and giving you the possibility to engage in dialogue and 
hold the states to account. Now, last point, of course, artificial intelligence is transversal in nature, goes into all wakes of our societies. So therefore, we have more colleagues at the Council of Europe working in their respective fields. Let me just tell you, data protection colleagues, bioethic colleagues, gender equality, of course, crime problems, combating terrorism, and the judiciary. And there you'll see towards the end of this year already some policy guidelines when it comes to predictive justice. Might be very important for all of you. If you want to need more, uh, learn more, please go to our website. We have formed a task force at the Council of Europe for all those topics, and we have a specific website on artificial intelligence. So Google it. Uh, that's always the simplest, and you get right to our website, Artificial Intelligence, for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sylvia. In the interest of uh, openness, I would say you can bing it or you can buy to it as well. <laughs> there we go. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, you made, I think, very, very important points, and... I hope you all noticed the theory of change, which is there's a role for governments, there's a role for business, and a role for civil society. If, if you don't put those three together, you're not going to get the change which we need to be able to uh, use AI as, as we would like to use it for rights and sustainable development. And you mentioned elections uh, as one of the many areas. And indeed, these are very, very engaging questions, whether AI can be deployed to undermine the integrity of elections or whether AI can be used to support the integrity of elections. This is kind of, a, it's up for grabs, uh, and uh, people know the European Parliament has an election next year. Uh, many countries have elections next year. We are going to see this beginning to, to take place as, as we speak. So, okay, let me move on to um, introducing our next uh, person, and I won't say Rome, but I will uh, cite the... <laughs> The fact that the International uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights has Article 19, of, after which uh, Thomas' organization is named. But in Article 19, the right to freedom of expression, it says, everybody has the right to seek, receive, and impart information across all borders and using any media. So there you have the organization across all borders, reports on frontiers. So Elodie, please, RSF. Thank you, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to be here today, and I would like to thank uh, UNESCO for this uh, invitation. I hope that you all know this uh, map, the World Freedom of the Press uh, Index. You can take a peek and yeah, with it. tweeting and forward. Um, for more than 30 years, Reporters World Borders has been fighting uh, for uh, freedom of information. We have been fighting for journalists who are sent to jail, who are arrested, who are tortured. Fifteen years ago, we started to fight against what we call invisible prisons. I mean online censorship, internet shutdown, a massive surveillance uh, to spy on uh, journalists and activists. Today, we are launching an international appeal for a pledge on information and democracy. This is it. Uh, to protect the public space of uh, information. The matter today, as, as it has been said by uh, uh, the panelists, and, uh, is that technology is growing faster than ever. At Reporters or Borders, we feel concerned about the rise in the malicious use of those new technologies and the impact on freedom of information. Last July, we published a report on online harassment against journalists. You can uh, type on your favorite search engine online harassment against journalists um, when trolls attacks, and you will uh, find it on our website. And we wrote this report to denounce the fact that online threats are today amplified by bots, by armies of trolls. And uh, those new threats are uh, increasingly used as a way to drown reliable journalistic uh, reporting. 
So I would like to say that uh, AI winter is coming. <laughs> and AI winter is coming if we don't pay attention, if we don't establish guarantees to protect the new public space of information shaped by private actors. That is why last September, Reporters Without Borders launched an independent information and democracy commission, gathering 25 personalities from 18 different uh, countries, Nobel Prize laureates Amartya Sen, Mario Vargas Lorsa, Joseph Stiglitz, Sakharov Prize laureate Owai Brahim, tech specialists, journalists, lawyers, they wrote this declaration on information and democracy. This declaration recognizes the global information and communication space as a common good for humankind. It also defends the right to information. It says that entities, platforms that contribute to the structure of information must respect basic principles. Basic principles such as political, ideological, and religious neutrality. They must establish mechanisms for promoting trustworthy information. And last but not least, they must be open to inspection. Last Sunday at uh, the Paris Peace Forum, a dozen heads of states announced that they have decided to launch an initiative on information and democracy inspired by this declaration. Among them, the Senegalese President Macky Sall, the Costa Rican President Carlos Alvarado, the French President Emmanuel Macron, and the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Besides this initiative, Reporters Without Borders is working on a complementary project to protect the integrity of the public debate, the Journalism Trust Initiative. Um, Nina just said that uh, trust is fundamental and we believe that trust in, is fundamental. So the Journalism Trust Initiative is an inclusive debate within the media community to set up shared standards on journalistic procedures. Um, and adherence to the standards could provide concrete advantages, like a kind of label uh, for the public. So. We have this today that I, I want to present this declaration on information and democracy, and the hashtag is information democracy. And the Journalism Trust Initiative, um, th those two initiatives are um, at different levels what we're trying to develop to reinforce uh, freedom of information uh, in our globalized and digitalized uh, societies. Merci, Elodie. Uh, thank you very much for your insights again. Another interesting uh, a new insight into, uh, into the discussion on artificial intelligence with, of course, a much clearer focus on, on press freedom issues, openness, transparency, freedom of information. And you mentioned uh, something which is very close to UNESCO's heart. My colleague Guy Berger is uh, very deeply implicated in this. It is the uh, whole question of safety of journalists. You know, we are a key player in the, in, the, uh, in the discussion, debate, and the action plan, UN safety action plan for protection of journalists and uh, the question of impunity. So I think that adds a new dimension. And uh, what would be interesting to see is to what extent uh, some of the declarations, some of the reports, et cetera, you, you mentioned uh, or you, you publish, and, and your work is greatly appreciated, as you know, across the world. Uh, to what extent do they have an impact or will they have an impact on the way we look at uh, issues relating to artificial intelligence? So that's the, that's the core of the discussion here. Uh, how does press freedom, freedom of information, uh, human rights, ethics, uh, all of that link with what's coming? Uh, you call it the winter of artificial intelligence. Uh, we are anyway headed towards winter. I guess everything will become winter soon, <laughs> but hopefully we can move on a, on a much more positive note. So um, thank you for, for, those, uh, for those comments and insights. Uh, I, I'm sure 
that the audience here will be looking forward to uh, reading some of the reports, uh, especially the recent report you mentioned. Some of your reports are, are well known and have been around for a long time, but some of the new declarations and reports that you published are, would be very much uh, of interest to, uh, to the audience in my opinion. So uh, I will give the floor now to my colleague, uh, Mr. Guy Berger. Thanks, Indrajit. So we want to come back to all the panelists in a minute, but we first want to hear from you because we thought you might have some quick, short comments or questions, and then they can always respond to those. And if you're going to be silent, we have questions for them, but I'm sure you're not going to be silent. And I want to single out uh, somebody who's here, Amos To. Amos, you still here? Good. We have, uh, yes. on, the, on the original panel list, we had David Kay, who is the special rapporteur of the UN on freedom of expression and opinion. He couldn't be here because he had to go back uh, to the fires in California, but uh, Amos is the legal advisor to uh, David Kay. So Amos, could you make a sh very short input and then we'll take other questions and comments and then we'll come back to the panel. Sure, um, thank you very much for the excellent interventions and I think you know we particularly align ourselves with the comments made by Tom um, from Article 19 pertaining to the impact of AI and its development on freedom of opinion and expression. So David apologizes, as Guy said, um, for not being here today, um, but he recently put out a report um, mapping out the human rights impact of AI specifically on freedom of expression. And I just want to raise kind of two key points that he made um, in the report before the General Assembly. And one is, I think, you know, given the role that um, artificial intelligence and automation plays in content curation and personalization, as well as uh, commercial content moderation, one of the more underlooked parts of freedom of expression is how that interferes with freedom of opinion. Under Article 19 of the ICCPR and the, the UDHR, freedom of, opi the, the, the freedom of opinion is absolute and there is no uh, permiss permissible interference with freedom of opinion. And for that reason as well, there has been very low jurisprudence on freedom of opinion. But David has mentioned in his report that um, AI-assisted curation which contains or might reflect certain biases and inputs are nevertheless held out to be an objective curation of factual information, particularly in search results, and that might have some interference with freedom of opinion. That's something that we believe should be researched and explored further um, in future policy uh, and, and other discussions. Um, and I think the clearer impact that AI-driven curation and moderation um, has on freedom of expression is um, on access to information, right? And there we have much clearer principles and standards. And um, it's not just, you know, the fact that AI is being used, but the fact that certain forms of um, AI-assisted moderation and curation are so dominant in part because of um, the monopoly that certain platforms have uh, on online spaces. And so um, if you have any questions about the report or if you'd like to check it out, uh, it's on our website. And thank you for letting me make this intervention. Thank uh, you. Freedex.org or the General Assembly's website. Thank you, Amos To, who, as I said, is legal advisor to David Kay, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion. Comments, questions, issues? Please introduce yourself also. Hello, everyone. My name is Emanuela, and I'm a Youth ISOC Fellow, and I'm from Brazil. And my question would be directed to Elodie, because since you are a journalist, I read this really interesting article that talks about IA journalists who are producing news about simple things right now, like uh, not simple, but well, saying that there's going to be an earthquake and then you don't have a human that produces this kind of news. And I'm wondering about the future because the owner of the narrative science uh, enterprise, he wants that in 2025, 90% 90, 90 he believes that 90% of the news will be produced like this. And today we talk about hate speech, we talk about social bubbles, and I wonder if you are directing the speech for a person in a really personal way, uh, telling them what they want to hear in a way that they understand directly, uh, 
what is the what is the perspective? Because you know, right now we have these problems with WhatsApp, with Facebook, with social bubbles. But if you have news produced for every person in a different way when they enter a journalism website, what is our perspective? And do you think this is possible? What do you think about this? Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. Let's collect a few more comments, questions. Anybody else in the front? Thank you. My name is Firdausi. I'm a current research student at Universitate Barcelona. I asked this question on the previous session to today this morning, but I don't quite get the answer. Uh, maybe to the Article 19, but the other panelists can also respond. How is uh, what is the best approach for uh, us in uh, creating the regulation, the law and regulation, about uh, towards the AI? Do we uh, consider AI uh, independency? It's like uh, humans who are minor and later they will become like adult, yeah? So the responsibility is not a share with the other human, maybe just independently. Because uh, uh, the way why we survive with the technology is often by making the analogy and metaphor. For example, when we're entering the f physical uh, environment, uh, we uh, make an analogy when we uh, access, for example, a uh, website or email other people, it's like we entering uh, other people. Yeah, I think that's the word question. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the front here? Yes, Giacomo Mazzon from the European Broadcasting Union. Um, we have heard in the opening speech of uh, President Macron um, some worries about the application of artificial intelligence to media and how this could um, blur uh, the, the frontier between the true and the fake. Um, I, I would like to have a, a general opinion on that from the panelists because this will pose a lot of problem to the media, a lot of problem to journalists, and a lot of problem to the algorithm that are supposed to, to make the journalism of the future. And the second small question for the World Web Foundation, it's, you told about the public data that have to be the base for a common good for the future. But the problem is that we have seen uh, example of public data made available, the NHS data in the UK, that have been hijacked by, to transform into personal data uh, belonging to single, each single person. So how in this reg uh, rules for the future setting up of the artificial intelligence world, we can be sure that this data will remain public and not hijacked for uh, becoming uh, transformed into personal data. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carlos Varela. I have a simple question. Mr. Thomas Hughes mentioned what I think is a very important subject, delaying deployment. And I think we should, I want to ask all the panelists, what do they think of this idea of delaying deployment? Because the world does not want to delay the deployment of many technologies. And I think this is what we need to do. Yep, very interesting points. I think um, uh, the, the, the uh, my name is Banu Mukhane. I, I work for uh, UNESCO. Um, one of the questions I think this panel was supposed to uh, uh, respond is, uh, what is the state of play for AI artificial intelligence as far as you know, sustainable development goal is concerned? Do we have, and I think you know, there are so many esteemed uh, panelists you know, and maybe a lot of uh, audience you know, could answer this question. What is the state of play? What is the uh, extent of digital divide as far as artificial intelligence goes, given the fact that you know we call someone in Gabon today and find out you know if this person is doing something with anal analytics, and three days later we call that person again, you know he will be posed by someone in in Berkeley. So this is happening. So is uh, or are you know member states you know, aware of this thing? Uh, is human doing something to increase the level of you know AI literacy globally? Okay, well, I think let's uh, get back to our panel then. And uh, those who want to comment on any of the points or make additional points, 
we have uh, 15 minutes left. And so each person, no more than two and a half minutes. Uh, so let's start right at the end with Elodie. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, um, I just want to say, I've mentioned the hey, hey, hi, winter. Hey, hi can be an opportunity, of course, for a newsroom. And uh, algorithm can help journalists. It's useful, for instance, to uh, lead, investi to investigate. And uh, this is, uh, I, I just want to mention the amazing work made by uh, OCCRP, Organized uh, Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. They analyze uh, huge uh, amounts of databases to investigate on uh, corruption. Um, so we can, um, use uh, Hey Hi in a, in a good way and it's, it can be very useful for journalists. Regarding challenges, and I will go back to your uh, question on, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the future of journalism and how we can defend uh, the freedom of information, uh, uh, considering the fact that uh, the, all the, this field is totally ch changing and being transformed today. Um, from my perspective, we can map four main threats on journalism today uh, due to uh, new technologies. And I, um, I go fast. <laughs> um, first, the amplification of threats against journalists. Today, you, you can buy 10,000 uh, tweets for $45. And this is uh, sold by private companies. Uh, they have a social responsibility uh, in the fact that their, their tools are used to harass people online and it's especially journalists to intimidate them. Secondly, I will say and micro targeted that micro targeted, uh, micro targeted, sorry for my accent, disinformation uh, uh, is a, a threat and is threatening the uh, space of uh, this new public space of information today. And this information spread through uh, chat apps as well. Today in Brazil, 46% uh, of uh, Brazilian people uh, share information through WhatsApp. And of course, we all have in mind what uh, happened during the, the, the last Brazilian uh, uh, election. And, um, and a lot of journalists where uh, false information on journalists uh, were um, shared on WhatsApp as well to discredit uh, journalists as well. And thirdly, I would like to mention the high technicality of this information and hate speech. Uh, at Reporters Out Borders, we feel concerned by uh, the development of what we call deepfake videos, for instance. And we know we are following some cases of journalists, uh, and especially female uh, journalists who uh, have been harassed uh, through this technique. Y you know, um, as Marco uh, said, the, the, today with Hey Hi, the thing is that everyone can use those technologies and you can find very easily some uh, application online and with those applications you can create a false videos and some uh, a lot uh, some people mix uh, the faces of journalists with pornographic content to discredit journalists online and and this is something that we can we can see and monitor at reporters or borders and last but not least uh, I, I would like to uh, mention the impact of the algorithmic distribution of, of information. Uh, this is what uh, Eli Pariser called the filter bubble. And now we can speak about echo chambers. And social information are like echo chambers. And we think that we need more serendipity. Okay, LED. Yes, just I, I'm uh, your serendipity. Yes, and Please. so so it's uh, necessary to uh, make journalism pluralistic again. I would say. Thank you. Before we come to others, maybe we take Thomas because he's also on this question of rights and expression and uh, AI. Okay. Um, so, kind of three three points. I would say, firstly, we at the moment see a an enormous proliferation of standards and initiatives and groups of governments and businesses and civil society coming together and producing different documents, which is very welcome and the enthusiasm is great. 
but it's extremely important that these initiatives comply with existing international human rights standards. Uh, and there is a tendency now to start introducing new concepts, new words, new pieces of legislation, not to connect these back to existing uh, fora, whether it be the Human Rights Council, the Council of Europe, and so on. So it is important that these continue to comply with those standards, because otherwise, although we are in a perfect moment of harmony around AI, possibly between states and civil society and businesses, uh, that will not will always be the case, and otherwise these will be standards that are used to erode uh, human rights standards as they currently exist. So what is offline should be applied online. That's the mantra, let's, let's stick to it. Um, I think in terms of uh, regulations, so Article 19 is working with some partners around an idea of uh, an uh, independent multi-stakeholder self-regulatory body for social media and social media content. Uh, I think that could be uh, applicable to other layers where within uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, so um, I think that would be uh, a pathway that could be looked at. Certainly countries like Japan and Germany have also introduced non-binding guidelines around AI and advisory groups and so on. So again, from a state perspective, that, that could be explored. Um, and lastly, on the issue of delayed uh, deployment, um, I, I, one of my favorite quotes from uh, pioneers of, of social media is the LinkedIn founder who said, uh, building LinkedIn was like jumping off a cliff and then building the hand glider as he was falling. Um, so, so this is the way the industry works, uh, and, and that's great. It creates massive innovation and things move quickly, um, but, I, but it is extremely important that there are human rights impact assessments on AI, and the understandings of them are well, un are well understood in advance to their deployment. Now, whether that means you know, a long delay or a short delay is, is, is not the question. It's not about time. It's about doing an analysis and understanding and sharing the results. And actually, one of my colleagues has just started in another panel. I'm not encouraging you to leave, but just started in another panel talking about human rights impact assessment. So I would encourage you to go to that after this. As well as openness and accessibility in multi-stakeholder assessments. That's right, Guy. Well and we have indicators at UNESCO <laughs> to help you do this. Well, uh, thank you, Guy. I, I will quickly pass on the floor now to our three next uh, uh, speakers, please keep your comments brief. I'll begin with uh, Nena. Thank you. Um, just ask a question about data. The basis is that publicly funded data statistics for public use should be open. That one is what we're pushing. And SDGs, some people, I don't know, that's still the Bible of development for the meantime. 17.8, our goal 17, data is actually one of the goals of the SDGs, raising data, data capacity. So data is at the beginning of the SDGs because we need to know where we are. As a goal itself, we need to enhance our capacity, have data available, and at the end, because we need to monitor where we're coming from. So I still live by data, and if you will allow me, I will roam. Uh, thank you, Nena, again, for your very uh, salient and cryptic uh, response uh, on, on this one. And uh, now I pass the floor to His Excellency the Ambassador of New Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to be pretentious, but I think that the fact that there is a representative of a government in this panel is very important, because I think that what I've heard here today is what all of us representatives of government should be hearing, should be listening to. And this is the idea behind, I, I think, uh, the context of this, of this uh, panel today, to involve all stakeholders, decision makers, civil society, private sector. And I think it's important that we have more of a, uh, an interaction and a, a, a mutual communication on all of these very, very important issues. Uh, and achieve the, 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 the proper balance to deal with the questions that, uh, and the challenges that artificial intelligence present to all of our societies. Uh, as I mentioned in my, in my original presentation, I think governments should establish uh, strategies and initiatives uh, to deal with all of these, all of these uh, issues that we've talked about this morning, and at the same time, there should be coordination between those strategies uh, and cooperation amongst all, all states on these issues. And this is where UNESCO comes in, and I think, uh, I hope that this is something that will be a continuing uh, development 
that, that we will uh, pursue. And you, you, of course, you know, can count with the, with the support of my government, but it will it'll be very important to get everybody on board uh, to deal with these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, I will now pass on the floor very quickly to uh, Mr. Grobelnik. As you know, we are almost out of time. Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, I will just try to go quickly through the answers on the questions from the audience, right? So uh, first, uh, this automatically generated news, right? You mentioned narrative science. This is extremely simple technology and won't go far away, right? Uh, working with Bloomberg, with New York Times and so on, of course, they use this, but for very simple news. This won't have effect by itself, but uh, automatically generated uh, uh, content, as Ludi said before, right? This has uh, its own um, place in uh, like trolls and uh, in social pressure across social media and so on, not uh, so much editorial. So this, uh, and now going back to this, uh, your question before, on threats, what Macron was saying, right? Threats to media. The problem is not visible threats, right? The problems are invisible threats, uh, the ones which you don't see. With today's AI technology, you can influence and move society, mindset. You can move mindset. So this is, these are invisible threats, which most of you, uh, maybe you are aware of them, but m most of you are not aware of them. Right, so manipulation is much bigger uh, problem than, uh, uh, let's say, simple, simple fake news. Simple lie we can find, right? Uh, manipulation we cannot find easily, right? Now, uh, what's the problem with media and AI, right? Uh, AI produced not the quality content, but pr produced speed. And speed is a problem, right? Because it's very easy to make somebody dirty uh, in a second, right? We can do this with one improper uh, tweet, but uh, it's really hard uh, to, um, uh, this, for this person, let's say, organization to make, uh, to make it clean again, right? And this disparity is causing the, uh, the trouble, right? Now, state of play related to SDGs, uh, digital divide, education. Uh, education is a problem, right? Uh, uh, it's not the problem that the content how to learn AI, how to operate AI uh, is not there. It's there. The problem is the educational system where teachers are not uh, adjusted to this uh, quick, uh, quick change, right? Uh, maybe uh, just uh, one more comment since I'm a researcher, right? So uh, I'm involved in uh, OECD, in European Commission, uh, UNESCO. Uh, right now we are uh, starting, right, soon uh, this uh, UNESCO AI Institute, which will kind of um, take part in these topics as well. What I see as a problem uh, on, in all these bodies, right, uh, uh, there are too many, uh, uh, not enough competence about AI. AI is happening while we talk, right? Uh, let's say European Parliament and others, right? The problem is that they don't know what AI actually is, what is being produced, what's possible, right? Uh, it's very easy to talk about high-level goals, but um, if you sneak behind uh, um, the uh, curtains of uh, big companies, uh, so delayed deployment, no way. This is not realistic. This is not realistic if you see what, what's actually happening behind. We can talk here easily about this topic, but it won't happen. Right? It's not about me or anybody here. It's about other people right? which, uh, which are competing on that front. Uh, okay, I could talk about these topics uh, way more, but so much. Uh, sorry, Marco, to cut you there. Uh, but we have Sylvia Grundman for your, your last quick remarks, please. Thank you. And let me come back to the real world for one moment and the real threats that cost real lives. And that is why the fight against impunity where UNESCO is leading is of utmost importance and it needs all our support. And therefore, at the Council of Europe, we are at the moment devising an implementation strategy to better implement our policy recommendation on safety of journalists and other media actors because we want to all team up and inspire the governments to better protect journalism and journalists and stop impunity. That's my number one. My number two, artificial intelligence and media and the blurring lines between fake, untrue, 
Well, there are some antidotes. And for us, antidotes is support to quality journalism. So we are working at that. We want to see how we can fire up governments to help quality journalism in all its different aspects, but without interfering with freedom of expression and the media. A challenging exercise, but we are ready to embark on it. We're working on it, and the end, at the end of this year, you'll see already some fruits. Um, the last point, uh, media literacy. This is what was also mentioned. We, we couldn't go into it here. There are specific fora for that but another one where we really have to uh, team up, as I said, and where, again, we need resources for it. So I call also on all of you to help us, to help international organizations. I know civil society also needs resources, but if we go more into pressuring those and also pressuring the companies that have deep pockets to in a neutral manner support the good cause, we can have more impact. I should not um, forget to say that for artificial intelligence, the developments will be so rapid, we've heard that from all of the panelists, that I think we have to think more strategically and also, despite the rapid developments, think long term. So we are reflecting now on a strategic agenda to also find the right balances between the benefits and the challenges and always come back to the human rights protection there. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. So um, you will see outside copies of the UNESCO Courier uh, and it's called Artificial Intelligence, surprise, surprise, the promises and the threats. Well, the way we've been talking, we've probably been talking the threats and the promises, not the promises and the threats, but it's important probably to say promises first. Now the threats we know, we've discussed, the threats for AI needs to do no harm, but AI also needs to be a promise, which is to strengthen human rights and to strengthen sustainable development. On that message, I also want to tell you tomorrow, uh, at Mozilla Foundation Paris, there's a, a meeting dedicated to helping advise UNESCO, what should we as an organization do that will really make an impact on this field. So you're all welcome if you want to come tomorrow to Mozilla Foundation in Paris. Uh, I want to thank Banu, and I want to thank Jan Hong, and I want to thank Jocelyn, who's organized this, and I want to thank the panelists, and I want to thank you, and I want to say um, enjoy the rest of the IGF, and I want to thank my co-moderator. I think it's been a great session. So don't forget the word that begins with R, ends with M, <laughs> and look at the UNESCO resources on that topic. It's very relevant to AI and all these questions. Thank you. Thank you.